What I want to talk to you about today is erectile dysfunction. It's not what I want to talk to you about. So we live in a really busy, really confusing, really stressful, really high information world. And the number of things we're called on to do and think about and problem solve and the choices we have to make every single day are like completely overwhelming sometimes. And I find that because this is the case, it's really easy to get lost and distracted and to just kind of get stuck in the details of everyday living and to, to forget the core principles which I learned at the monastery, which I've, I went to the monastery to learn, to learn these, to learn something true, right? And that's kind of for me what the definition of a principle is. It's, it's like a, it's a truth. I hate that word, but there it is. It's like a truth that you can orient your life by. I really needed one of those. And so what is this core principle or truth? <laughs> now we get to the hard part. But to, to put it stupidly and um, quite obtusely in words, I would say... <laughs> that's the essence of this principle or truth. So what I want to do now is maybe try and unpack what this core principle or truth was by talking about, first of all, Sansa or koan practice and then the five skandhas. You ready? Here we go. Take it away. So as I've talked about a lot before in this channel, koan practice was an extremely important part of what I did at the monastery. So it was very quick, very clear, very direct interaction with the Zen master. So this is the Blue Cliff record. It's a collection of koans. Now, I mean, I can open up to any page in here. Um, Case. So this is the koan. One day the world honored one ascended his seat, the world honored one being the Buddha. Manjushri struck the gravel and said, clearly behold the Dharma of the king of Dharma. And the Dharma of the king of Dharmas is thus. The world honored one then got down off the seat. That's it. That's the koan. My teacher didn't really use so many classic koans. He had his own, his own questions that he would give you as koans that you had to answer. And one of those questions was, when you see the bird, or when you see a plant, or when you see the oak tree in the garden, where are you? Okay, so now we have the koan. When you, when you see the bird, where are you? Let's go to work on it. So there's three parts to this koan. You see bird. Three parts, right? Then the question is, where are you? Okay, what I think Ro what Roshi is asking is, when you're having any moment of experience, any moment of experience, it doesn't have to be seeing a bird, it can be any, anything that happens during your life. Every moment of your life, something's happening, right? So when you're having an experience, how does the self arise? And then where does the self go when it's done arising or disappears? Then where does it come up from again? Where does it go? Up, down, death, birth, death, birth. How does the self arise? So to answer this question, we're going to look at the activity of looking at a bird through the teaching of the five skandhas. So if you don't know what the skandhas are, Google it. It's a great teaching from Buddhism. But they are basically, it's a Sanskrit word that means heaps or bundles or collection or aggregates. And it basically refers to the five material and 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 mental things that come together to give rise to the self okay so we're going to unpack this process of the self arising when we see the bird through the skandhas 
So the five skandhas are form, feeling, perception, conceptual fabrication, and consciousness or cognizance. Okay, so the first skanda is form or rupa. So what this refers to is the like the givenness, givenness of material reality, right? So I open my eyes and I see a bird, right? There's my material reality and there's the bird. It's, a, it's my body and the bird's body, right? And, and materiality has the elements of wind, fire, earth, and water. Water, givenness of form, matter, materiality, rupa. That's the first skanda. So the second skanda is feeling. And feeling is like raw, unprocessed, sensory perception, right? It's like, it's good to pause on this and just um, feel it for a second. Feel feeling, right? It's like you see the bird and there's a moment, a... a, a a sub fraction of a moment where no thought has arisen yet, no, per, no critique or labeling or naming. So I like the word raw here. Feeling is raw, unprocessed sensation. So the third skanda is perception, and now we are exiting the realm of the raw with perception, the object, a sense, sensory object is now coming into view, it's taking shape, it's being formed within us. It's, we're heading towards thinking, right? And now we come to the fourth skanda, which is conceptual fabrication. Now this is an interesting one. So it means like coloring in or filling in. But what are we coloring it in with? We're, we're beginning to stain it and shape it with our own opinions. So the bird is now becoming a thing inside of our head where we're beginning to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. We're having memories of birds. We're having judgments of birds. We're having opinions of birds. We're in the world of bird thinking now. And finally, we come to the fifth skanda, which is cognizance. I like that translation, cognizance. So at this point with cognizance, the fifth skanda, we're in the rich realm of we're in the realm of the rich stew of self. We've got interlapping thatch work of self stuff going on here. We've got, we're thinking of thoughts about our thoughts. We've already had this whole process go on where we saw the bird. Now we're thinking about, who knows what we're thinking about now, right? Like the bird flew by and then an instant later, I'm, 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 I'm having a memory of my mother. Right? So cognizance is the final skanda. And this is the, this is the, my opinion and experience is that cognizance is where, where I think most of us actually live. And we stay at the very surface and at the very top of this, this, this process of the self arising. And we tend to identify ourself moment after moment after moment as this cognizance, the thinking about thinking. Thinking about thinking. By the way, I've been um, uh, referring to this guy, Glenn Wallace, and his book, Basic Teachings of the Buddha, during my explication of the skandhas. He's a helpful guide on this topic. This is a good book, I recommend it. Seriously, how are we gonna answer this koan? When you see the bird, where are you? Come on! Fortunately, we have the answer. This is a printout of some old lectures that my teacher gave when he's talking about this very koan that he gives. He says, I quote, at the very moment that you see the bird flying in the sky, at that split second, are you thinking of yourself? Are you thinking of a bird? Yeah? Huh? Hmm? Are you thinking of God or the devil? I think that you are not thinking about anything at that moment when you are looking at the bird flying. It's the same thing when you hear a sound, he says. When you look at this fan, apparently he was holding his fan, 
at that one moment, the self and that which is not the self make relationship with one another and manifest what we call one true nature. That is Zen practice. There's that moment when the self and that which is not the self, how does he put it? Make relationship with one another and manifest what we call one true nature. This is like the most basic fundamental part of Zen practice that I learned. That which is self and that which is not self making relationship with one another. Because every experience that we have in life, every experience that I will have from now until the moment I die is going to be self coming into contact with not self. Okay, and there's a reason that I ran through the whole five skandhas. It's like such an important teaching because what the five skandhas do is show you how, how the self arises, right? So first there's just the sound wave. Let's say the bird calls and it's a sound wave, right? And then the sound wave hits my ear and now there's feeling, right? And it's like, instantly, it's like pleasure. Oh, the bird song, how beautiful, right? Just, just a feeling of pleasure. And then that feeling of pleasure begins to form into a recognition that it's bird song. And then the recognition becomes memories. And then the memories become thoughts. And then I start thinking about the thoughts. Do you understand what's happened now? The bird has flown away. The bird is gone. Even if it's in the sky and I'm still looking at it, it's a billion miles away because the self is now standing between me and the bird. And I'm not making relationship with it anymore. Make relationship manifesting one true nature. So this is the truth. This is the principle. What does it mean? I remember being at my wits end after my first couple of, of practice sessions, training seasons, and I went to a car wash with an older priest who was also a good friend of mine. So we're sitting there, and I think this was, this was in Los Angeles, and it was one of the car washes where it's like, it's on the tracks. We're watching the car go through, and I'm like, it's kind of like my Zen practice. It's going at about the same pace, seems to be barely moving. So we get out of there, we go sit down on a picnic bench. And I asked my, this friend of mine, like, dude, what is Roshi talking about? When I see the bird, where am I? Like, what is he talking about? You know, I'm, I'm like, I, I wanna get this. I, I, I wanna get something from this practice, you know? It was kind of my mentality. Or it was just frustration. Kokoan practice is hard and, and you really get, you really push yourself. You're backed up against the wall. Everybody who does it kind of has this experience. And I remember my friend, he, he said, but he, and I said, do it, do it in front of me right now. Manifest the answer to this koan. And he's, and so he, so, so I said, manifest this picnic bench. When you see the picnic bench, where are you? And so he goes something like, you know, I'm like, dude, I don't know what you're doing, you know? And so he goes, so he goes, he points to his flag and the flag was flapping and he said something and then it, I was like, oh, it's in my stomach. It's moving in my stomach. The flag was moving in my stomach. It was like I could, it was like the, I could feel the flag's movement as my own. I could feel it inside of me. Like, or I was inside the flag and the flag was inside me. And that shut me up because something had happened there. Something had happened and my mind just went still. That's the great thing about, about having a, a good spiritual mentor is they can, it's like a, they put a drop of, of water on the burning tongue of fire inside your head. So for me in that moment, manifesting one true nature meant that nothing is fundamentally separate from anything else, except that thinking makes it so. You start thinking, 
as we saw in that process of the skandhas, and suddenly the direct connection between you and the bird is lost. So when life gets really busy and really difficult and really confusing and really dense with responsibilities and expectations and fears and hopes and desires and I want to pull my non-existent hair out and scream, there's always a principle we can return to. One true nature. And that one true nature is connection. Your boss is being a total jerk. You got rejected from the uh, film school. Everybody is swiping past you on Tinder. You laugh the laugh of the Buddhas. Ha! I am one with all of you people who are rejecting me. We all share one true nature. You're in the grocery store and it's crowded and busy. Maybe if you can focus on something, it's a block of cheese in the refrigerator section or the squeaky, uh, that, one, that one wheel on the grocery cart that's moving around crazily that the stand-up comedians always talk about and make fun of, that you can focus on that one wheel and maybe you can feel its crazy movement as your own. Like I felt that uh, wagging of, flapping of the flag as my own because we all share one true nature. We're all uh, different aspects of the same thing. So you don't have to take your individual problems too damn seriously. Over and out. Kaput. Hello friends. Uh, I hope you liked today's video. I hope it didn't give you indigestion or cancer. I wore my Opa sweater. Opa means grandpa in German and it has leather leather elbow patches just for you to let you know that I have a Patreon page and if you want to support the work that I do here, you can sign up. The link is below here or it's in the bio. Um, I'm had such a good time with this YouTube channel, even though I know I'm not great at this. Uh, it's not my wheelhouse. I'm more of a writer, um, which you can find out if you go on Patreon. I have all my, a bunch of writings up over there. Uh, but I've had a great time making these videos. And if you want to support this channel, you can sign up on my Patreon. And there's all kinds of cool stuff over there, essays and blogs. And I'm also thinking about starting up like a, a monthly meditation sit on Patreon, like a, like a uh, online sangha sitting group. So check it all out over there, folks. I really appreciate it. Ciao.